Hello, and welcome to my series on the CT of thoracoabdominal emergencies. I'm Dr. Benjamin Strong, the Chief Medical Officer of Virtual Radiologic, or VRAD. I started my career with an internal medicine residency and followed that with three years of work as an emergency physician. I then returned to training for a radiology residency and a fellowship in body and MSK MRI. In the course of my over 20 years in radiology, I have worked as a private practice radiologist, an academic radiologist, and for the last 17 years as a teleradiologist for VRAD. I have been the chief medical officer there for eight years and am licensed to practice in all 50 states. Here is our agenda for this series, which I have broken into nine sessions of eight cases each, all grouped by organ system. Session five, emergencies of the small bowel, part two. We'll begin with a case of closed loop obstruction. Again, a surgical emergency. This one starts with extensive arborizing intrahepatic gas, which extends to the periphery of the liver, consistent with portal venous gas. Lower down, you can see dilated, thick-walled loops of small bowel in that stacked or accordioned configuration so suggestive of closed loop obstruction. In addition, there's plenty of mesenteric stranding and extraluminal foci of gas. You'll see throughout the images that is present both in the portal venous tributaries uh, as well as in the mesentery proper. You can see as well a few examples of pneumatosis in the anterior abdomen, and here as well. Again, thick-walled bowel, and note the distortion of the mesenteric vessels. That will be particularly clear on the cine, and again, we see multiple locations of pneumatosis here, but lowest uh, down here in the lower abdomen and pelvis, you can really appreciate a contiguous loop here of small bowel with significant pneumatosis clearly sealing the diagnosis of ischemic bowel. Here we see the arborizing portal venous gas, the stacked, thick-walled, and mildly dilated bowel loops, the mesenteric gas, note the pneumatosis in multiple locations, and probably the best example of pneumatosis here in the pelvis, that long loop of small bowel involved. Now let's watch the vessels. Note how they twist towards the right and then reverse and twist back the other direction. All right, so that is a case of closed loop obstruction with bowel ischemia and portal venous gas. Our next case is an ingested wishbone with bowel perforation. See small foci of free intraperitoneal gas in multiple locations here. Stranding throughout the mesentery. And here, two prongs of a calcified density within the lumen of the small bowel. And you'll see on the cine that will turn out to be uh, two limbs of a wishbone. So here are all the little foci of free gas, mesenteric stranding, and there is that wishbone. Of course, ingestion of an entire wishbone is suggestive of another problem, that being alcohol ingestion, although, of course, it was the holidays. So I also learned from our teaching file the actual nomenclature for a wishbone, and that is a furcula. So that is a turkey furcula causing a small bowel perforation. Our next case is a spigalian hernia. Just wanted to be sure everyone has seen one of these. That is a herniation that has occurred through the internal oblique muscle, but the external oblique muscle remains intact. And you can see it draped over these dilated thick-walled bowel loops. There is definite mesenteric stranding here consistent with strangulation. And note again that intact external oblique uh, 
making this a spagalian hernia lodged between the two layers of muscle. So here we can see the bowel entering it and exiting, again, only through the internal oblique. And that is one I would definitely call strangulation. The bowel wall is thickened, there's clear mesenteric stranding, and there is a clear caliber transition right there. So a spigalian hernia. Our next case is an unusual type of hernia, a Richter hernia. This is a hernia where only one wall of the bowel has herniated out. And there you see the anterior wall of the small bowel is herniated, and there is a small fluid collection surrounding it. On the cine, you'll really appreciate the dilated proximal small bowel loops and the fact that they transition right at this Richter hernia. Note those dilated small bowel loops and see how the afferent loop and the efferent loop are such distinctly different caliber. You may have noticed this patient incidentally has cirrhosis as well. So that is a Richter hernia, a hernia involving only the anterior wall of the herniated bowel. Our next case is an acute presentation of Crohn disease. This patient presented initially with appendicitis, had surgery, and then had continued fevers and abdominal pain three weeks post-op. This is a typical scenario for the presentation of inflammatory bowel disease. You see these enlarged mesenteric nodes, which are far too large for three weeks post-operative, and there is significant mesenteric stranding present as well. Also, there is a loop of terminal ilium that demonstrates thickening and distortion, highly suggestive of neural inflammation. In the pelvis, there is an excrescence of gas extending from the right lateral aspect of the sigmoid, and this later turned out to be a fistula there's sort of a nascent tract extending upward to the right lower quadrant, the previous operative site. Another loop of small bowel here with uh, stricturing at both aspects of it, again suggestive of Crohn's disease. So here we see the mesenteric adenopathy. Look at that mesenteric stranding the elongated distorted terminal ilium, and now the tract forming from the right lateral aspect of the sigmoid. There's that strictured, dilated, short loop of small bowel as well. Sorry that gets a little busy, but there's a lot going on. Adenopathy, terminal ileal distortion, tract formation, and dilated loop with stricturing. Well, to seal the deal, you can see these inflammatory erosive changes of the sacroiliac joints in this relatively young patient of 22 years of age. That obviously is an inflammatory sacroiliitis, so frequently associated with inflammatory bowel disease. And there they are on cine. So putting it all together, it's a pretty clear-cut diagnosis of Crohn disease with a post-operative presentation. Our next case is a Meckel diverticulum with perforation. This Meckel has it all. There is an inflamed blind ending pouch here in the right lower quadrant, and there is a tiny focus of gas suggesting a perforation. Next cut down, you can really appreciate a calcified stone there within the diverticulum. That's a very common feature. Again, you can see uh, the stranding and the gas consistent with a perforation. On the cine, note especially how the loop of terminal ilium runs past the base of this diverticulum. 
in both directions. So you see it going anteriorly there and posteriorly there. We'll watch that again so that you can appreciate these small foci of gas on the stranding around that perforated diverticulum as well as that central calcification. So there is the gas, the calcification, the stranding. And again, note the small bowel heading off in both directions, which enables you to say this is not, in fact, an appendix. So that is a Meckel diverticulum with perforation. Our next case is a severe appendicitis. There is a tubular density that creates a complete circle here. It's really more properly termed a hypodensity. The appendix in this case is so edematous, so swollen, and so friable that it's really barely visible, uh, just a ghost of its former self. So this is the top portion of the complete circle that it forms. Lower down, you can see the two sides of that arc. You're beginning to appreciate, too, dilated bowel and the encirclement of both the terminal ilium and the cecum by this swollen appendix. Here is the lower portion of that circle with all the associated stranding. And there is the encircled uh, terminal ilium, which you can see is constricted here in the pelvis. On the coronals, you can really appreciate that uh, ill-defined circle that is the appendix, encircling the terminal ilium right there in the right lower quadrant. Here it is most posterior, more posteriorly. The top portion of that arc of the appendix is visible there. And again, the terminal ilium compressed by the encircling appendix. Here is the cine. Appreciate again the dilated bowel loops. And there's the top portion of the appendix and its bottom portion encircling the terminal ilium and causing that obstruction. Let's look at that one more time. Again, dilated bowel. Here the top portion of the appendix and the bottom portion all surrounding the terminal ilium and a portion of the cecum. Here it is on the coronal really allows you to appreciate the circular configuration of that swollen appendix. There we go. So that is a severe appendicitis, I think as bad as appendicitis can get without perforation. Our next case is another appendicitis. This one with associated colitis and pneumatosis. You can see here, up near the hepatic flexure, clear pneumatosis, these collections of gas that are defying the laws of gravity, especially arranged along that posterior wall. Here you can see an appendicolith amidst a great deal of right lower quadrant uh, inflammatory stranding and a dilated appendix. Here again is that pneumatosis extending all the way up to the hepatic flexure. And then the dilated appendix with stranding and an appendicle lift. Let's look at that again. That pneumatosis is important to spot. This fairly extensive and a nice fluid-filled ascending colon that lets you distinguish that gas in the wall. And there again, the dilated appendix with an appendicle lift. So that is another case of appendicitis, this one with colitis and pneumatosis. And that concludes session five. Thanks for watching.